Es sind Gründe von Stein in meinem Leib, an Antik und Dich. I have never asked for people. So there is a reason. Basically, I am a hard lover. And being a star of a legendary artist, I really appreciate whatever you did in the last few weeks. First of all, I come to all the schools to participate. Wonderful. Thank you, Jibon, for bringing them here. And thank you, Ma'am Tapana and Jean, for letting us know and giving our talent to our fans. Thank you very much for that. Secondly, Secondly, I must say thanks to the teachers who are working on this skill development, art classes, creative classes, business to you, Kenya. So my thanks is due for them all. And in the years to come, together we can master this talent. I know, I know we have a potential, we have a talent. But we are that we take a proper direction, guidance, and a request assistance. So thank you very much. And I am happy to see that the reason my past is to alter will be considered very serious. Julie, if I should let's not talk to all of you.
Your Eminence, Professor Samdono Mutsimi, respected teachers, distinguished guests, and ladies and gentlemen. It is a boss privilege that I am standing here at this prestigious stage and given you this opportunity to express my warm words of welcome to today's chief guest for the event, His Eminence, Professor Samdono Mutsimi. Today, it's an honor, not just for Seba, but for all the Dham, to get this precious opportunity to learn and inspire from one of the greatest educationists, far-sighted visionary, thinkers of the 21st century, His Eminence Professor Samdol Mochele. We are deeply obliged to His Eminence for accepting our invitation and making this event a reality for all of us. Correspondingly, I cordially welcome our teaching community of the Dark, who have chosen this valued profession as the mentors of the society and dedicated service and education for our coming generation. Your Eminence, Sabal is a very small organization comprising of five members and works on three areas. Number one, spirituality, two, alternative education, and third, sustainability. So now, coming on education and some reflection on the kind of education system in Ladakh. It is true that education in Ladakh has undergone substantial change over these years in terms of opening up more and more schools, upgradation of school infrastructures, more government jobs, comfortable lifestyle, etc. However, there is still an uneasy feeling among the concerned citizens of Ladakh who are witnessing growth of everything in Ladakh except education. Here I quote Jitu Krishnamurti, education is to go to school, to learn how to read and write, to pass examination, to play a few games and after you leave school you go to college, pass an examination and then get a job, get married and settle down. And at last you forgot all what you have learned all these years. This is how we are educated all these years and the result is before all of us. So now the question is that this education system, what we think is that it doesn't prepare us for life or to teach us how to make the world a better place. We are taught that if people do well in school, they will also do well in life too. Every day we contradict between what we are taught in school and what we see in real life. Kids care more about grades, pass an examination, memorizing facts, take a degree, finishing syllabus, than they do about learning, understanding, concepts, cultivation of creativity, curiosity, innovation. Our education system teaches that being right is important than learning what you don't know. It rewards right answer and penalizes us for making mistakes. Subjects like art, culture and sports are defined as co-curricular activities and not as education. So, now without taking much time, I humbly request His Eminence Professor Samudan Rupo Chirli to kindly reflect His Eminence's views on educating the educators. Thank you once again to all of you. Venerable monks, the honorable principal of this school, the organizers of this seminar, the participants of the seminar, the teaching community, and dear students. My hearty greetings to you all and I appreciate, also congratulate for your uh, conscious effort to prove the system of education and for that purpose to educate the educators is considered to be one of the important matter in today's education system. But unfortunately, <clears throat> I have nothing to offer which would be 
of useful to your endeavor because of two limitations of my the first limitation is uh, i am an uneducated person i never been educated at any time so therefore i have neither the capacity nor the authority to talk about education education in this real sense of the word as understood up to day has a peculiar and particular connotation i have said this several times and sometimes it become a joke accidentally i have been the president of the association of indian universities during year 1998 and in my presidential address i have said that the community of vice chancellors of the indian university system have chosen a one completely uneducated person as your preacher person this should be considered as a liberal attitude of the indian people or the carelessness of the indian people so people laughed and similarly i have said this one of the all india conference on now talin education system of mahatma gandhi sometime in 90s in varanasi at that time also i have said that i don't know anything about education which of you are talking in this all indian gathering i only know little bit of shiksha if you are talking about shiksha then i can say that shiksha is the consist of the shil the pragyan and the the shil and the samadhi and the pragyan this threefold learning makes a person shikshit or this is the nature of shiksha and this utterances have been permanently covered by media people and particularly late shri dharampal ji have wrote an elaborate article on this and there have been quite a hectic discussion and debate on this for several months again it happened today here an uneducated person is talking about educating the educators so this is something very uh a kind of uh, dichotomy which may not be acceptable, acceptable to common people the second limitation is uh, the medium the language i was told that this seminar is uh, conducting in english language and uh, the school where this seminar has been conducted is a school of english medium i never learned this language at any stage and in the beginning i resist to even pick up but later on due to many constraints 
I have to uh, surrender to pick up few vocabulary for day-to-day -day life usage. Delivering a serious matter, such as educating the educators, my language will not be adequate to express my feelings or my own concepts. And particularly, it is a bit uh, embarrassing situation in India, that is also in Ladakh. We are using the language of colonizers even after 70 years of political independence. We consider we achieved the independence of India, independence, not Swaraj, in 1947. And since then to today, 70 years have been passed, but still will we think, we talk, and we act exactly on the same way when British was our ruler. There is no change whatsoever. This is not a, an unfortunate event for Indians alone. This is an unfortunate part of the entire humankind. The power of domination by someone which does not have legitimacy still has uh, such deep rooting effect. After letting the political governance to themselves, yet the mindset, the thinking process is still under foreign domination. We are not able to recover the Indian ethos of thinking, talking, expression, and acting. We are absolutely dependent on foreign language, foreign way of thinking, and uh, foreign way of relationship and conducting. So due to these two limitations of my make it difficult to offer you something acceptable or useful for your endeavor to improve the education system in Ladakh and particularly for the coming generation which will be called as the 21st century generation. I still lead my life in a civilization, Indian civilization of 7th century. And therefore, it's very difficult to uh, interact or relate with those people who have completely forgotten, for, forgotten the ancient Indian way of thinking and living completely in a modern, ultra-modern and post-modern civilization. So there's very little 
possibility of uh, interacting with each other and uh, there's not much compatibility between our way of thinking. So therefore, you will uh, forgive me that my presentation is um, not useful for your purpose and even not acceptable according to your concept. But there must be some room for everyone to carry one's own way of thinking or ideas so that freedom hopefully guarantees by the Constitution of India. So therefore you have invited a wrong person for a wrong purpose. In spite of that, you have invited and I have accepted. So we shall have to use this uh, tense locked as we planned before. Before I begin my summation or my presentation, I have one specific uh, request. That is, uh, don't to be carried away what I have said. Don't reject it outrightly before examination. Buddha have said to his disciples, you examine my words thoroughly through rational mind, logic, and reasoning. And if you find it finally, according to your rational mind, acceptable, then do accept. Otherwise, don't accept. Just because this has been said by Buddha, or I have devotion or belief in Buddha. So that is not way to listen to me. So therefore, my request to you is, uh, as Buddha has said in the Kalam Sutta, don't believe whatever someone has said, he or she may be famous scholar or this and that, but you examine that thoroughly. So what I'm, whatever I'm presenting before you, is uh, of my perception. Perhaps some of them, my idea and my concepts as well. And that may be wrong. You must have your own power of rationality and uh, a sense of reasoning. By reasoning, and by rational examination, thoroughly, in depth, and then something found is acceptable, you may accept them. Not acceptable, you may just reject them or forget them. So this is how to listening to someone's talk. Today, we have a Bad habit. The habit is uh, to accept anything without knowing. Acceptance and the knowing is entirely different. In our Sanskrit or Hindi language, we call it mana or jana. Jan kar ki mana has something significance. Mana without jana, that has no value. And it is a part of 
blend fit. In today's education system, there are a lot of things are being asked to accept without any examination. That is uh, dangerous. That's why I used to say some of the religious traditions have a encouraged blend faith, just to faith without any examination. And the similar blend faith was also spread by the modernity, particularly modern science. Most of the scientific research done by someone are being asked to accept by everyone. Each one doesn't give the opportunity or freedom to examine for himself or herself. Someone has uh, brought out the result after some kind of uh, experiment or research, then that is uh, accepted by everyone. I can make a Example, two, three years before, I visited the Museum of Manam at uh, um, Bhopal, and uh, the curator conducted my to right from the beginning, he told me how the humans have been evolved from monkey, chimpanzee, and then later on. So I asked him, how do you know this? And he told me that it has been written in a so-and-so book. It's the theory of such and such scientist. And uh, I have read them and I know them. He might have been experimented and examined, but you have your own rational mind applied to this, and you have uh, examined it is correct or it is not correct. So he said there's no need, because uh, the Darwin has already done all these necessary experiments. OK. Then I asked him, why? The monkeys of today, chimpanzees of today, still roaming around as animal form. What is the deficiency in their gene? They are not able to evolve into human being, and the others are being evolved to human being. The science can explain these monkeys has this kind of deficiency in their gene, therefore, they are not able to evolve. He says, no, nobody has research about that. Then how you can say you know it? You just accept it. So knowing and accepting is entirely different. If someone really wish to learn or become a shishit, he or she must be trying to know for oneself. And someone have suggested or some have said, you can take it as a basis of your examination. Nothing more than that. And unless and until you complete your examination, you must say, I do not know. It is written in the book and it is told by a teacher like this, but I do not know. Knowing not knowing is very difficult. You might have heard the story of the Sukrat. Sukrat is our Hindi pronunciation. Your English says Sokarti. And he was pronounced as the wisest man of the Athen by the oracle. And he puzzled. Then he visited many 
wiser people who consider, he considered who is the much more wise than him. And then finally he said, the, the oracle was, uh, oracle might be correct. No one knows what they do not know. I know that I know nothing. The Socrates statement is that he knows that he knows nothing because he is all in the process of inquiry, in the process of searching. He is not reached to the finality of the knowing or percepting or insight or realization. So, to know what one not knowing is a key factor in the beginning of shiksha, or you may call it education. Now coming to your anxiety, the shortcomings of the present education system. The present education system all over the world in general, and uh, in India in particular, is not adequate and not a perfect one. This has been accepted by everyone. No one argues that this system, present system, is uh, perfectly, profoundly all right, and that does not need any improvement or change in it. So this is commonly accepted. But how to change it, how to improve it, that is so many different ways. The present education system is inadequate that is also very politely accepted and expressed by the His Holiness 14th Dalai Lama. His Holiness 14th Dalai Lama is a very compassionate and polite and he does not criticize any system or any conception, but he still very politely says that today's education system needs a great deal of improvement because the education system is unable to make the students an ethical person. Therefore, he is talking about the secular ethics and so on and so forth. So this is, uh, you also realize that maybe the logic may be different, but you realize that and uh, most of the world's educators, the teaching community, or the political leadership, or spiritual leadership, everybody thinks that there's something need to improve. So now, I would like to uh, present before you my personal idea why the shortcomings are, what is the basic reason. I say my personal opinion, it may not be very accurate. The way of my thinking, although it is minority, there are number of authentic personalities everywhere. Everywhere means in India, in West, in East, all over the globe, you will find a minority. Many people think according to what I'm going to explain to you. The inadequacy of education system is due to the incompatibility 
and the tension between the tradition and the modernity. Almost anything, there's a great deal of incompatibility between the tradition and modernity. And the modernity, which I'm talking about, now this may, be, may not be called today as modernity, it may be post-modernity. There are several different ways of uh, explaining the modernity, the modernity, ultra-modernity, and post-modernity, they have different ways of um, defining them. I'm not going to in these details, but whatever the post-modernity is a product of modernity. And modernity has a, a history of 300 years, not more than 300 years, it is just recent time. And due to this way of thinking and way of acting, the humanity has seen a great deal of change. This change may be termed as a development, or it may be termed as a growth, or it may be termed as a simply change. So I use the word change. Growth is also not bad word, but development is being used by everyone, the modernity, industrialization, development is being common usage, but I do not agree it is not a development. Development means only for better and good things, and development is for better and good things, it should not have it. side effects of great challenges to all living beings. So what is termed development of today is not that. Its side effects are immense, tremendous, and it is challenging the existence of the all living creature. The right to life is being challenged, and the existence of the small planet globe is also in challenge. So therefore, the change and growth has taken so much during the last few decades, a uh, few, uh, few centuries, two or three centuries. And uh, this modernity has uh, destroyed a number of balances which are essential for the benefit, happiness, and uh, harmonious coexistence of all living and non-living creature on this earth. Due to shortage of time, I only just touch uh, points which you may elaborate later on. The balances which exist in the ancient tradition, which are disturbed by the modern civilization, the number one is balance between the self and the others. Self and the others, if possible, the others shall have to be given more priority. And if not possible, self and other must be given equal importance. Whatever you do, whatever you think, it should not be harming to others. Therefore, self and other need uh, equal consideration, which keeps the balance, do not disturb the harmonious living of the living creatures. That is. Uh, uh, that is number one. And secondly, the society and the individual. Society is more important. Individual is a, a part of the society. 
If society is okay, the individual will also be okay. If society is disturbed, the individual cannot be remain undisturbed. So therefore, society and the individual need a kind of interdependence and balance. This balance has been disturbed by the modernity. Now the individuals are given paramount importance, individual right, individual freedom, so on and so forth. And in the, on the cost of the um, harm to the society, we have chosen the individual benefits. So this is the second kind of uh, uh, disbalance. And the third kind of disbalance is uh, more dangerous. That is the balance between the right and the responsibilities. In the ancient time, each right is uh, a de derived from a responsibility. If you are performing a responsibility properly, there's no question of violating your rights. But today, the right is beginning paramount importance and uh, the responsibility is being completely ignored. The so-called uh, organization, United Nations, has a declaration, universal declaration is a very big word, universal declaration of human rights. But there's nothing about human responsibility. And no one was able to even draft a document which is referring to human responsibility. So right is overriding the responsibility. That is a big uh, misbalance. And similarly, the balance between cooperation and competition is also reversed. The human beings, or most of the animals also, they are um, depending on community, society. We are social living beings. The human beings are social living beings. The Western language, they call us the social animals. I at least say the human, humans are not animals. We are not social animals, but of course we are social living beings. And to have a, a harmonious living in the society, we must need the cooperation of the everyone. And without cooperation, no one can survive properly. Now the cooperation is being completely destroyed by the throat-cutting competition. Everywhere, so-called education, so-called service, so-called work, so-called economic process, so-called politics, wherever you go, there is a competition. Right from the childhood, at home, your parents teach the competition, the school teaches the competition, and everywhere. Thereby, you become completely alone. No friend, no associates. Even your brothers and sisters, they become competitor, not cooperator. So this is a great disadvantage of the modern civilization. And apart from that, the modernity has another disadvantage is the so-called industrialization has given the humanity a capacity to produce community much more than they need. And by this way, when they are able to produce things more than need, then they have to be marketed. And to market, the people have to be trained into consumer, not user. In the ancient time, we are users of the communities. We use the air, we use the fire, we use the space, we use the uh, everything 
using means whatever I need, I use that. Gandhi has said a very beautiful sentence that says, the Mother Earth is capable of satisfying every living creature of, on this Earth to their needs. No one would be deprived of its needs. But the entire globe Earth cannot satisfy a single person's greed. So this is very accurate statement. So we are not able to uh, um, satisfy the greed. So the producers of the communities more than need find the human greed is very easy to exploit. And by exploiting human greed, then need is forgotten and we just consume, we are not using. In English, user or consumer. Today, everybody calls as a consumer. No one is user. In Hindi also, upayog, upabog. Yog and bog, this is in Hindi terminology. The yog, but today we have made the yog as yoga because it's re-imported from the Western. Yoga become yoga. Otherwise, yoga means a spiritual journey. And bog means a worldly indulgement. So this is very clear. Now we are upabog the things. We are not upayog the things. We are not able to uh, uh, make uh, establish yoga with the community. So that's how the today's challenge, we are talking about the scarce of drinking water in coming few years. And uh, each resource is uh, not infinite. The desire is infinite. And therefore, the damage to the ecosystem, the climate change, the global warming, all these challenges which does not have any remedy to the scientific community or to the political leaders. But they are looking at each other. You do something. Better you do something. But no one is uh, willing to do anything. So this is uh, the modernity. This modernity has uh, disbalanced all this balance which need for a proper living and leading a meaningful life of every living creature has been disturbed. So on this process, now the so-called your education has to be fitted somewhere in this chaos, what I have told you. Now, today, education is no more for the dispelling the ignorance and uh, acquiring the knowledge or the wisdom. It is an uh, input of information make you competitor to any of your competitors and get a job. Do not remain as an owner, as a master. Become a servant of someone who pays you the good thing. So the evaluation of education everywhere, if you go, they ask, what is the employment rate of your alumni? And that means how much people your education institution is able to make a servant who are working under somebody. And a servant means giving up all the freedom and independence and do something 
somebody else's instructions or orders. So this is uh, the way to evaluate the success of education. In the traditional way, there's no question of unemployment problem because each one is uh, engaged in some of the, their family vocation, family work, and the people are even for kind of India, the distribution of work is also the distribution of cost. And that makes each person has uh, an occupation by birth. So today, that occupation system has been completely ruined, and uh, we are compelled to uh, do some chakri and uh, some servant service. Recently, the Vice Chancellor's Conference at Tirupati, accidentally I was called there, and the, all the Vice Chancellors talking about uh, the employment, the problem of unemployed, and uh, how much employment oriented education uh, is. Uh, able to achieve. So I cemented them that you ever have to think about the present education system, have developed the capacity to face the challenges of the world. The increase of war, violence, violence becomes a trade, increase of environmental degradation. The people are not getting a drink of water. The water shortage is being pronounced. And even the breath, a clean years, not available. The water and the air is the basic essential community to survive. Without water, no one can survive more than three, four days. Without year, no one can survive more than five, six minutes. And this kind of absolutely unavoidable necessity things have become scarcity. And the global warming and the uh, dis disappearance of the glaciers, these are all talk of the town talk of the world. Everybody knows the challenge. And all the new kind of diseases which are coming. So why we are not sitting down and think about the education is giving a remedy to these worldwide challenges which are threatening the basic survival of the earth and the living creatures on this, but that is completely ignored. So, my time is uh, finished, but I shall take a few minutes more just to, um, just to say, when I talk about modernity, uh, in relation with tradition, the modernity which departed from the tradition has created all these problems and all these challenges today the humanity is facing. Um, how to define what is modernity? And this is a great deal of definition, but I only quote my beloved friend, late Professor Saran. He has uh, summed up the definition of modernity in a few sentences, uh, he says, um, novelty, self-grounding, violence, synony to modernity. Novelty means it is not uh, coming from tradition, 
is just uh, something new. Self-grounding, it doesn't have any background. It's standing one's own shoulder. And which creates all the time violence to people, violence to living creatures, or violence to the nature. So that is synonym to modernity. And what I'm talking about tradition, that also you need what is tradition. All the perpetuated customs, systems, or habits are not a part of tradition. This mistake must not be carrying in our mind. There are many different ways of um, defining the tradition, but the most accurate and appropriate is the definition given by the Kumar Swami. Kumar Swami was a great Buddhist scholar of Sri Lanka in the early 20th century. And he says, coming from authentic source, he is a Buddhist, therefore he says authentic source. If someone Christian or Hindu, they might say coming from divine source. And the second is coming down through an unbroken lineage. And the third component is verifiable by logic and reasoning. If these three components are there, then this is a tradition. For example, what is a Buddhist tradition? The Buddhist tradition means taught by Buddha himself, that is the authentic resource. And coming down to me, up to my teacher and to me, without breaking the lineage. Buddha have taught someone, he has taught someone, and she has taught someone. This lineage must be unbroken. And yet, it needs to be verifiable through logic and reasoning, and that is tradition. So in the Buddhist custom or Buddhist um, system also, there are many things which are not belonging to Buddhist tradition. They are being uh, carried in through perpetuated um, ways of doing the things, repeating the things. These are not belonging to tradition. For example, in Hindu, the caste discrimination, trust caste system and caste discrimination is not a Hindu tradition. It is uh, uh, polluted into the Hindu society through um, corruption to the tradition. So we need what is a real tradition and what is a, the corrupted thing. The modernity is arise because of the corruption of tradition, particularly in the, in the West. In the West, the spirituality or the religious traditions are being corrupted through political power or the feudal system. And that was being revolved by the uh, common people and that's why the modernity, the production, the industrialization, and the secularism, and all these are being created through the mistake of the corruption of tradition or degradation of tradition. And that's why today we are not able to um, harmonize or not able to uh, reconcile the real thinking of tradition and the attack of modernity. So if someone is, uh, have the capacity to understand what is tradition and live in the tradition, then he or she can deal with the modernity quite easily. So then finally, I will say a few words about the education system of India after India's independence. Before India get independence, 
someone asked Gandhiji very specifically, many people say Jawaharlal Nehru and you have differences on important issues. So Gandhi said, Nahi kuch nahi hai. There's nothing different of opinion. Then the questioner insists, Nahi nahi kuch to hai, sab log kehte hain. To kuch to hoga, batai. Then Gandhi said, there is a small thing. Jawaharlal chate hain, ki angrez Hindustan se chala jaye. मैं चाहता हूं कि अंग्रेज बेशक रह जाए अंग्रेज यता यहां से चला जाए ये हमारे मतभेद हैं सो दिस वाज अ वेरी प्रोफाउंड स्टेटमेंट द इंडियन लीडरशिप ड्यूरिंग द इंडिपेंडेंस स्ट्रगल गांधी वाज माइनॉरिटी ऑफ वन टू फाइट अगेंस्ट द मॉडर्निटी एंड मॉडर्न सिविलाइजेशन द डोमिनेशन or colonization of India by British was a direct result of modernity and modern civilization that was not understood. And instead of political independence, Gandhi was looking for a meaningful Swaraj. Swaraj is uh, very difficult to understand. So, when independence was achieved, Gandhi was already denounced by the leadership and he had written that they behave me as if I do not exist. This was three, four days before he was assassinated. It was a good thing he was, I, I shouldn't say it was a good thing, but he assassinated in early time. Otherwise, he lived longer. He might have a, a great insult or disrespect by the, the then Indian leadership. It was quite uh, um, perhaps an inevitable situation. So, Anrejiyata ko jana nahi dena chate the aur Anrej ko to baga diya. The first thing an independent India should do was to have an appropriate education policy and education system for the independent India. And uh, that didn't happen. Gandhi's system of uh, Nautalin was never been experimented or implemented by anyone except a few Gandhi duties. So after independence, the first education commission was headed by Radha Krishna. With all respects, Radha Krishna was a completely a modern Western outlook. Therefore, he was an advocate of the modernity and uh, Western system of education. From Radha Krishna Commission to Ramamati Commission, I think a half dozen of commissions are set up. Nothing had happened. Radha Krishna, didn't, uh, Radha Krishna Commission did not um, recommend any substantial improvement in the education system. Then one of the bit better commission was uh, Kotari Commission. Kotari Commission was mostly talking about the benefits of teachers and the pay skills of teachers, which was implemented. It was good. Then the final, the last commission was uh, Acharya Ramamati Commission. And we have great hope for them. Ramamati Commission was set up by, uh, um, by the uh, 
Vishwanath Pratap Singh, during his uh, short term uh, pre ministership, but Ramamati Commission could not submit a report, the government was fell down. And Ramamati Commission's report, Ramamati was in the Gandhian, and we know a great Gandhian educationist, and uh, his uh, report was uh, quite good and substantial changes have been recommended and which was just put in the best papers and no one has even, I think no one has even read it. So that is how the basic recommendation of Macaulay, Lord Macaulay, in the 1830s to aim a create a class of people who are by face or race or color Indian, but by temperament, way of thinking and aptitude, absolutely British. That class will cement the rule of British to India without much expense and without much human resources required. At that time, British was very much a, a shortage of uh, manpower. Of course, the UK has a very small population. So by creating this Babu class of people and which get so success, even after the independence of 70 years, Lord Macaulay is in our hearts and in our heads, and the entire education system is verbatim what Macaulay have said and Macaulay have written. Today, the internet is very popular, and anyone wish to read uh, this proceedings of Macaulay's Education Commission, and it's very, very, um, um, what I should say, insult to entire the Eastern civilization, Eastern uh, system of knowledge, and Eastern system of education, everything. Before British rule, or before the, uh, even before the uh, Muslim rule to India, India had been uh, under the foreign power for about 400 years, and during which period there are a lot of destruction. And uh, before occupation of foreign power, the India has the largest and the greatest education system, which we have forgotten. And the Sundarlal have written, Bharat me, Videsh uh, rule, British rule, and though the two volumes, and in which he have uh, stated all the ancient system of education, how systematically these are being destroyed. And uh, furthermore, um, Dharampalji, after a great deal of research, several years of research in British Library London and also in India, and he have written a book, The Beautiful Tree. And in The Beautiful Tree, he has given the ancient education system of India and how it was perversive and how it was so good for the uh, Indian society, which had been completely ignored, completely destroyed during the British rule. So this you must know as a teacher how the education system has been changed during the British rule, what was the, before that, because before foreign power, India was the only country which have influenced more than the uh, three-fourths of the world by the Buddhist, by the Vedic, and by the other ancient Indian wisdom has so much influenced the other countries and which in reverse completely destroyed during the British rule, which we need to know and these things are there. Then, 
during the British rule in India, there was few um, attempts have been made that you should also know. One is Rabindranath Tagore. Rabindranath Tagore was not satisfied with the British education system, and he has evolved his own education system, which is basically based on the Sundriya Vidya, the aesthetic science of India. And he tried to evolve the education around the sense of aesthetic, around the uh, science of aesthetic. And he established the Vishwa Bharati, Shanti Niketan. Now, of course, it is one of the usual universities. And he tried there. And the second one was um, Arbindu Ghosh. Arbindu Ghosh was a converted British, reconverted in India. Um, Arbindu Ghosh, right from the childhood, been under the care of the British uh, nurses or governors. And then at the age of seven, he was sent to uh, London. And till 23, he lived in London. He was not allowed to learn his own mother tongue. He was not allowed to learn anything of India. And he tried to make completely a British person. Then he come back. He learned uh, uh, Indian spirituality, Indian tradition, language. And he evolved an um, education system. Still, they are running a number of schools. Arbindu Ashram schools. These are minority, not very successful, but the system was uh, uh, very um, valuable. We should know what was the system. And the third was, of course, Gandhi. Gandhi was evolving the education system around the uh, vocation. Any kind of vocation can be center of science and uh, learning, and uh, that can be e evolved uh, education system. That is now telling. And Gandhi have written very um, emotionally, this is my last offering to my beloved nation, to India. But his last and best offering has been completely ignored by us. And today, there are only uh, 10 or 12 small schools which are following the Nautalin system. And the, then the fourth was Madame Mohan Malviya. Madame Mohan Malviya was an uh, advocate of Western education, but his uh, advocate was with Western education, we must uh, parallel um, Indian education should also be brought up. He established Banaras Hindu University, and uh, in which the ancient learning and the modern learning were tried to put at parallel, and uh, he was also not very successful. So these are the, what we happened in the past. Then Jiddu Krishnamurti. Jiddu Krishnamurti was also very much uh, emphasized the uh, um, education system. And uh, he does not uh, give us a systematic system of schooling or higher education. He is more based on um, mindset, the philosophical background of education. And he always says, cannot be taught. The people must learn. The education must be for awakening the inner intelligence of the individual. Thereby, he or she can be flowering in goodness. The flowering in goodness must be the result of education. And the education must be result of one's own self-knowledge or awakening. I consumed uh, about uh, 20 minutes more, for which I apologize. Thank you very much. Uh, Your Eminence, uh, with all my humility, I'd like to ask one more point, one question. Uh, is there any such thing as originality? Is there any such thing as originality? This question is uh, 
very complicated and also pervasive. The question is, is there such thing which is uh, considered to be or which is called as original? To answer this question, you have to examine what do you mean by using the word original. The definition of original is very from culture to culture, tradition to tradition, or language to language. There are many different ways of perceiving as original. If we come to a particular Buddhist viewpoint, then the Buddhist way of looking at things are through Two truths, the ultimate truth and the relative truth. And the ultimate original will be of the only ultimate, ultimate truth. That means the negation of independent inherent existence of anything. When you negate that, the negation itself is uh, an original that is not depend or that is not being polluted by anything else. And similarly, the relative truth, since it is being given the status of truth, that also needs to be original. original. And that, that is original, original because, because the, the negation, negation of, of the existence of inherent, inherent self-existence, self -existence, then how to exist interrelatedly through a partiti samadpan through, through an interdependent origination, origination. That, that is, is also, also very much very original. original. That, that is also, also true. true. It, it cannot, cannot be denied in any way. way. It, it does, does exist, exist as, as it appears. appears. So, so in, in the Buddhist, Buddhist ultimate, ultimate viewpoint is, is not duality between, between the appearance and uh, the suchness, the tathata, there's, there's no difference, difference. that there is original. original. And, and therefore, therefore I, would I would say, say yes, yes, there, there is, is a ultimate, ultimate truth, truth and, and there, there is, is a relative truth, truth which are of original. original. But, but that, that maybe sound, sound very Philosophical. philosophical and, and not, not relevant, relevant to, to directly relevant to ordinary person's day to day life conduct or relationship. And in our common conversation, we use the original is in many different ways. Any production of a community by someone famous industry which has a trademark and some kind of reputation in the market 
and their production, their own production, the reality, would be called as this is original thing. And some other company might have replicated it. It may be good quality, but not exactly the same of the first production. Then the second is called replica or not original or artificial or something like that. So this is in a different context. And in that context also, we cannot deny the existence of original. Then it comes to ideas, philosophies, and literature. Particularly literature, anyone's work, whether it is original, or it is influenced by someone else, or it is copied somewhere, from somewhere. So these are many different levels of looking to originality. An idea of a person coincidentally very much similar to an idea of someone else living far away, thousands of kilometers away, and not knowing to each other. But the two ideas become similar by accidentally. No one has influenced or copied by the other person's idea. And in that matter, both of them might have called original idea because it is not influenced or it is not copied or it is not imitated. So therefore, it is termed as original writing or original idea. But all these things have to be um, measured and defined on different contexts, on different level, on different situation. Generally, when I say an idea or a piece of literature or a concept of philosophical tenet which are of authentic Permanent and which is not a imitation of any other such thing can be termed as original. But that originality is not representing the true truth as I mentioned before. They are perhaps the, the basic originality and from which many years of originality can be transpired or can be manifested from time to time, from situation to situation. But one thing we must uh, um, aware of is imitation of something else without one's own application of rational mind and thorough examination which creates the 
imitative things, the not original things, and which are, in any case, harmful, not only um, good thing, but it would be harmful to that imitator or the usage of that imitation in any application. This much I can say. I don't know whether your original question is being answered because this can be interpreted in many ways. Reviving tradition in the present age is uh, not an easy and a simple thing. Many people question that it is at all possible to revive, particularly the Buddhist viewpoint, everything is transitory, ever-changing. Anitya, impermanence. Therefore, once, once a thing is past, that cannot be revived or repeated. This is uh, one of the viewpoint. The other viewpoint is uh, it may be possible to revive, but what for? We are quite happy and comfortable in the present system. And what is the necessary to revive in the age-old past things. This is also one of the questions. And uh, the third question is, the third viewpoint is, everybody is free, free to choose any way. Someone, Someone may choose the traditional, traditional way, and no one, one would stop, stop it. it. But, but it, it is uh, not anybody's, anybody's business, business to, to change, change nationwide, nationwide or worldwide, worldwide the, entire the entire system. system. That, that is, is not possible, possible and, and that, that is not also, also necessary. necessary. So, so these, these are, are different, different points, points of view, view prevailed in the Today's this world. world. Howsoever how so it, it may be, be my, my personal viewpoint view is that, that if, if someone, someone feels, feels that, that traditional way of living, traditional way of, living, way of thinking, thinking is, is 
good, good and, and benefitory for oneself, then one must live in it. Gandhi and Krishnamurti both saying the same thing. If you wish to change something, you must first change yourself. And if you are able to change yourself, or you can revive the traditional teachings in you, then you can experiment it with others as well. Without changing oneself, without reviving the tradition in one's own life, the talking and thinking about the revival doesn't have much value. Why all the time when I introduce myself to the audience, I accept that I do live in the civilization of the 7th century in general, the tradition, so that people should know they would like to outright reject or just experiment with me. So without knowing, the keeping in dark may not be good for oneself and for others as well. The curiosity is increasing and the advocates of the tradition is also increasing. Not much in India, but in the Western countries where the experience of modern development have been completed and they are able to see the demerits of the modern development and they are looking for going back to the tradition. This is increasing. And therefore, we shall have to watch another 20 years what will happen. And uh, I keep my fingers crossed. I will not claim that tradition can be revived. And uh, this is the method to revive the tradition. I have no such strategy for reviving of the tradition. Whosoever is interested, I am ready to tell what is the tradition and what is the benefit of the tradition. Otherwise, uh, I do not adopt the modern system of uh, marketing it through advertisement or uh, through various means to influence the other people. That is not traditional method. That's not way of tradition. Whatever is trying to be marketed, that is already uh, polluted by the modern way of thinking. A process is going on, dialogue between modern science and the Buddhist science under the leadership of His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama. This dialogue process has been remained there for the last more than 30 years and during which period several institutions have come up. The basic institution is uh, the Mind Alive Institute in America. They are conducting the dialogue between science and Buddhist science. His Holiness divided Buddhism, uh, divided Buddhist, Buddha's teaching into three categories, Buddhist philosophy, Buddhist science, Buddhist dharma. Buddhist dharma is only for Buddhists. The others have no business about Buddhist dharma. The Buddhist philosophy and Buddhist science is common to everyone. That is not belonging to the religion. 
So we are sharing it with the entire world scientific community. And which is giving signs of a real basic change in the thinking of the so-called modern science people. And it may be resulted in future some very uh, positive form because uh, the modern scientific knowledge has limitation. And Buddhist science, Buddhist philosophy does not have any limitation. So a limited knowledge or limited thing comes to an end of its utility. And at that stage, it shall have to depend on something which is unlimited. So this kind of dialogue may bring for the revival of um, ancient knowledge of India, the non-retreating, so on and so forth. So what I would say as a um, partial response to your question is uh, if anyone wishes to revive the tradition, one's own individual life, it is absolutely possible and so easy. It is only requires your intention and willpower. And you can do that. And also you need a thorough knowledge of tradition. Then you can revive in your life. Your, your life. The second question, can you help reviving it, it for many, many other, other people, people. that is also possible. If your, your question, question is, uh, can we revive, revive it at, at national, national level or at state, state level? level? Can, can I revive in Jammu Kashmir the traditional, traditional way? way? I have, I have doubts, doubts because uh, uh, we, we are, are still, still under, under the British rule in our minds, minds. and it will not going to be disappear in the near future because all the leadership needs this mindset. It is their uh, capital of politics. So therefore change brought in a larger society level, state level, national level or world level. I should, I should I not say it is impossible, impossible but I, I would say it's, it's very, very, very difficult and unlikely. unlikely. One, One possibility, possibility is a change takes place in the West, West and then it will import it to India. India. Then, then Indian people might be accepted. It. We, we have uh, exported yoga, yoga, knowledge of yoga. yoga. Now it becomes yoga. yoga and re-imported in India, and everybody accepts it. So this um, example is there. So I don't say impossible, but it is not so easy. Lovely, you have to after British rule, education system has been spoiled. Yes, yes, yes. Past is just history, so now what we have to do is change our education system. Right. What we the students, what things we the students have to do Mm -hmm. to make education system better. Okay, okay. The young, bright boy is asking, the education system has been polluted during the British rule, and now we need to change it or improve it. And for that process, what the student community can do, what is the contribution of the student's community? So this is very positive way of thinking, and I appreciate uh, his idea. Due to shortage of time, I was not able to uh, go into the, some of the details. The system of Shiksha, there are three direct stakeholders, and the fourth one is uh, indirect stakeholders. And any change 
we are proposing or thinking to bring up around the three direct stakeholders shall have to be in cooperation, not in competition. The three stakeholders are the teaching community, the students community, and the parent community. And the fourth is the administration. And the last is the society at large. So we have to make skillful methods to bring a change by coordinating the teacher, parent, and student together. Any curriculum or any system of education or any system of learning which need to be implemented in a particular school, the three components must be in agreement. First of all, the teaching community must be living in that system, not accepting, just living in that system. There are many teachers who do not agree to the system, but due to his or her employment or livelihood, they have to do the things as they are told to do. And there is a, a conflict between the mind and the action. So therefore it does not work. Similarly, a change is brought and the change is not agreeable to the teaching community and due to the administration or due to the society, he or she has to do that work unwillingly, that will have no effect. The conviction of the teacher to the system with which he or she is going to proceed learning with the student the conviction, the faith in that system, in the mind of a teacher, and teacher take is a, as a his or her a life mission to implement it. That is the first requirement. And the second is uh, most important is uh, uh, students community. Students community must be understood what is the purpose of his or her learning right from the class 1 to the class 12. 12 long years of one's best past of the life, part of the life to be spent in the school. One should have the right to know why, what for, what is purpose, what is the expectation. And with that clarity, then students community can tell the teaching community, we need this kind of system. And the teaching community can again discuss with the teaching community, the students community, the merits and demerits of such proposition. And there should be clear understanding between the both of them. I used to say the learning system generally should build up teacher-centered because unless teacher is uh, capable, cap teacher has the capability of that teaching, that learning, then there is no use. So the system of the learning should be evolved keeping the teacher as at center. Then at the period of transition or in the classwork, then the second is student-centered. Students should be given the more importance when what 
the subject and the curriculum or the plan of learning is to be implementing, the students would be more giving importance and more giving the say. And the third is the parents' community. And the parents must be agreeable to the system, to the teacher or to the student. What they are doing, the students must, the, the parents must support them. What happened today, most of the students are being forced by the parents' desire. You must become an engineer, you must become a daughter, or you must become an MBA, so on and so forth. And then they keep a reward and punishment system. If you become top monster in the class, I will give you bicycle, or I give you this digit, so on and so forth. Or otherwise, I will cut down your pocket money, or so on and so forth. So parents are very um, cruel for driving the strength's duration. Whether the strength has willing, unwilling, or capacity or non-capacity, these are not being properly considered. So therefore, these three components need to be come together, discussed thoroughly, and any system cannot be imposed by one side. The imposition would be then it will no more shiksha, neither education, it would be uh, indoctrination. You must differentiate education from the indoctrination or brainwashing. So education must be give you chance to inquire not to be accepted what is being told. So, what I can suggest for the students' community would be students should consider what they are learning in the school is really useful for their life, for becoming a good human, good human being, not become a good nokri, servant. To become a person, independent person, who can serve the others, who can help the others. In other words, who might be able to give employ to others, employment to others. So this kind of way to examine what the learning system you are being given in the school is useful and perfect for your rest of life to become a good citizen and good contributor to the society or good lineage holder of the tradition, so on and so forth, whatever you may wish, you may wish and that should be discussed with the teachers and with your parents as well, and the cooperation of teacher, parent, and student can make the administration to follow. And thereby, the society and the state might think a gradual change. So, the number one is to question the present system, its merits and demerits and think about alternative systems. What kind of alternative system you can recommend? And thirdly, to pursue the teacher, the parent, and the administration peacefully, cooperatively, bring those changes according to the um, wishes of the student. So students can give a leadership for bringing a betterment into the education system. Thoroughly examine the existing system and what is the shortcomings in that and what are the betterments if we adopt some alternative things and all these uh, 
a student should know. And if you have limitations, you should ask the teachers and uh, other wise people. And also now the modern um, facilities give you access to wide range of information. So therefore, you can find out for yourself what is the best. And whatever you think the best, you should have the courage to express it. I do not mean that what you think might be ultimately correct. But you are able to express it, then there would be respond, there would be dialogue, there would be discussion, and there would be a, a collective inquiry and learning, and thereby a lot of things may come up. So therefore, students should take a lead. I'm speaking. Yes. Okay. Uh, just now, someone asking you yes. about uh, origin. Original. Original. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It reminds me mm -hmm. the word mm. uh, I heard before. Mm. The origin of education mm. means uh, mm. the word means mm. to draw, mm. draw potential. Mm. So to to draw potential of individuals, mm -hmm. to draw potential of society, mm -hmm. draw potential of future other. Mm -hmm. Uh, it sounds for me very alternative education, yes. but uh, at the same time very original. Yes. Yeah, so how do yes. you think about it? Yes. Yes. I am very much in agreement with this question. The questioner says that uh, origin of the world of education is uh, deriving from the world of uh, drawing the potential of the student. I do not know how the education world has been evolved and constructed. It must be some Latin word, and which might be later on developed in the Western language. But basically, the traditional idea is uh, the whole shiksha or education means to uh, awake the real potential of the student or of the learner. That's why the Buddha's way of teaching was very different from the other teacher's way of teaching. Buddha never remained consistent. Sometimes he taught there is the existence of self. Many times he negates the existence of self. At many times he says the mind is uh, exist inherently and the object does not exist inherently. And finally, every instance is of interdependent nature. So that's why there is uh, four different philosophical schools of Buddhism have been, came into being. He always teaches how to suit the capacity and the potential of the learner, the listener. And he never imposes his knowledge or wisdom to the others. So, so the, the real, real education is to, to draw the potential, potential of, of the student. student. The Buddha, in other ways, said that each sentient being has the seed of Buddha nature. And that seed of Buddha nature shall have to be nature to sprout. And for nurturing, this is the practice of the spirituality or teaching of spirituality. That's why 
Jidhu Krishnamurti also always says that Tritiri is only a facilitator to stimulate the wisdom or the seed of wisdom in the mind of the student. That's why Buddha has also in the common teaching, common teaching means the Paramita teaching. He did not use the word guru or teacher. He used the Giveshini Kalyan Vikra at a same level. Not an authoritarian, but to be a friend, to stimulate the inner strength of the student, to awake the potential of student is the singular objective of teaching or giving shiksha or giving education. So by drawing out or stimulating the potential of student, which can be applied to the community, for example, the potential of the whole Ladakh to be awakened or the potential of the whole India, this can be enlarged at any level. But that needs a very systematic and good method of how to stimulate and how to awake the inner potential of the student. Even the modern educationists also in some degree agree with that the potential and willingness of student is the basic criteria on which um, on which subject the student should undertake at the high level. The child's psychology is considered to be one of the important components in the teacher's training, but which are not properly implemented in any way. So, as I mentioned before, a beginning of the in the intelligence, intelligence of the student means that drawing the potential of students into light. And, and for that, that you cannot, cannot authoritatively taught the, the student or give something a very a kind of easy technique how to awake it. The student and the teacher both learn jointly, uh, collectively. Collective learning and collective inquiry is a constant to be basic necessity. And to do so, we have to completely revise what is the objective of education, what is the expectation of the society, the parents and students, and how to lead a life of inquiry into this suchness jointly by the teachers and taught. So, I appreciate your idea and the, the question and I uh, agree with that question. Uh, we are having this discussion actually just out of my curiosity. Like, I just wanted to know that uh, in the very beginning, you thought about the theory of human uh, evolution or changing, human evolution, the Arthur theory. The Arthur theory. theory. In the very beginning, you thought about the Darwin theory, that is the theory of evolution. Okay, okay. okay. That uh, human evolution, that is the body of changing of chimpanzee or monkey to human. And from your talk, I understood that 
You have already accepted the Dharma Thori and then it's okay if it is comfortable to you, I have no objection. I didn't say I oppose the Thori. I only say I do not know. He has said it, but, but I am unable to find it for myself. This story is uh, correct. <laughs> I have no separate theory how to evolve the humanity. The Buddhist viewpoint is all the living beings are coming to being by the force of karma. And, and whatever, whatever karma in the, in the past, past life accumulated, that, that gives a result, result in, the in the next life. life. So, so we, we are not in the, in the process, process of searching, searching the evolution theory. Right, right from, from the beginning of the existence of this globe, this is earth. earth. There, there are theories of how the living beings are born here, here from other planets, planets and from other um, living worlds. worlds. So, there is no need of uh, uh, evolution, evolution from different form and, and in an, into, into different form. form. If, if this, this evolution is uh, of a uh, true, true, then, then why, why the, the evolution, evolution is stopped? stopped? The, the human beings can, can also be evolved some, some other form, form, a better form. form. Sometimes, Sometimes we feel Two hands is very short. short. If, if we, we have, have four hands, hands we may be able, able to perform, perform. we may drive, drive a bike, bike and, and also, also operate a light dog and listen to the, to the, um, uh, uh, to the, the telephone. telephone. If, if we, we have, have four hands, hands we may function, function much better. better. Why, Why we are, we are not evolving in that stage? Or, or is there, is there a possibility of evolving that way in the in future? future? Can, Can someone predict it? All, all the forms of individual living creatures, creatures are result of, of a particular karma. And, and that, that particular karma is being accumulated by someone and, and then, then it is, is being born, born in that form, form right, right from, from the beginning. beginning. This, this is, is how the Buddhists Buddhist are being looking out. out. But, but we, we are, are not saying that the Dharma theory is completely, completely wrong. wrong. If, if that theory has an answer to my questions, questions how much year they are taking and how in this way they have evolved, evolved what, what was the exact reason evolving in that way, and then, then it is evolving to the stage of human form as of today. Now it is not evolving any further, what is the uh, stoppage to it, and, and the rest, rest of the uh, monkey community. I am living in Himachal Pradesh, and, and there is a lot, lot of problem due to the <laughs> monkey community. <laughs> And, and I, I very, very much, much wish they, they are all evolved into Himachal human beings, <laughs> then that is very, very, very easy. easy. Now Himachal government has set, set rates, rates if, if someone, someone kills, kills a monkey. monkey. So, so these questions, questions are need to be answered. Answer. If, if scientific theory has an answer to these questions, why not I agree to that? Even the Big Bang theory, the Buddhist way of 
look into the big bang according to Carl Chakar. Or the modern system of big bang. There are very similarities. But most of the questions relating to the big bang, which are modern scientific people are not able to answer, it might be find an answer from the Buddhist perspective. So, so there, there are many, many ways, ways to look in at it. it. So, so any, any, anyone, anyone is uh, comfortable with it eventually, and it's okay. okay. But, but what, what I'm, I'm saying is, is you have accepted, accepted it, it. You, you are not, not knowing it. it. So, so if, if you, you know, know it, then you are able, able to convince, like, like people me, people like me, and all the questions need to be answered. I sitting in this hall will agree with me that uh, schools have a lasting impact on the life of the children, uh, either positively or positively teachers' impact. Having said this, uh, Your Eminence, my question is, uh, what is the role of, of a school uh, in terms of capturing to the spirituality of the students? Because uh, by law and by law, schools should be secular. But uh, we all believe that all of us, when I say all of us, I also mean the children are spiritual beings at the end of the day. So should there be some spiritual teaching in the school or is spirituality not the role of the school and the question. This question needs to be a great deal of uh, examination and analysis. The question is uh, related to two different components. The first component is uh, students community and their need. There's one part. And the other component is the school administration, which is under a governance of a, a state. A state means a government. It may be state government or central government, a policy, so on and so forth. Spiritual journey for an individual is different journey from his or her journey into the organized education system. Organized education system has its own way of imparting the subjects which are being framed in its curriculum and which is under a policy of a state and if the state is of a so-called secular state they may not able to include any tradition of spiritual learning can be included into the school curriculum. So therefore, school curriculum shall have to be completely in the framework of secular teaching. So therefore, no question of including the spiritual training. Even a school is not governed by a secular state or it is run by some kind of a religious organization or individual person with intention of imparting spiritual education to the younger generation. In that case also, there are certain 
problems, limitations. The classroom teaching is not the way of imparting spiritual teaching. And the relationship between teacher and student is not a relationship between spiritual teacher and taught. So therefore, again, from the religious viewpoint also, in the formal organized education system, teaching of spirituality in the school may not be proper and appropriate. As I mentioned before, His Holiness the Dalai Lama has classified the Buddha's teaching into three categories. In that matter, for example, Buddhist, the Buddhist philosophy and Buddhist science may be a subject to be taught in the classroom, but the Buddhist Dharma will not be, cannot be a part of curriculum which are to be taught in the classroom or which are being taken into the examination. So in a short, I may say, the spiritual preservation is uh, individual and uh, learning for organized school subjects is a community uh, journey. So these two need to be separated. That's why the teaching of ethics, the secular ethic and non-secular ethic have to be divided in, differentiated, and the secular ethic can be a part of uh, organized school's curriculum or syllabi. So therefore, if you are questioning, if I understood properly, Spiritual teaching should be included into the school subjects. If that is a question, then I would say no. Then, in that case, the students are deprived of fulfilling their desire to learn spirituality. That should be fulfilled even by the organized school, by separate way of teaching, a kind of uh, so-called extracurriculum activity, not in the subject of examination, not in the subject of classroom teaching, but to benefit and to fil fulfill the desire of a student. Occasionally, the students may visit the monasteries and have spiritual teaching, or spiritual teachers can be occasionally uh, invited to have spiritual discussion or teaching occasionally. And in that way, then, the method of teaching should also, according to the Dharma, and the teacher and the taught shall have to be a relationship between Guru and Shishya. So all these complications need to be considered. And we are given 45 minutes to transform the mind of children. We are told that you should tell them the IQs of the children. But we are, you know, in our society and in the world wide, in the teaching peculiarity, I think that it's a very important question because we are often lacking on the emotional portion, which is, I think, my mentor has to coordinate to give a full individual um, uh, what, what would that mean? So please, how could we utilize, judiciously utilize 45 minutes to transform both the heart and mind of the student? Thank you. <laughs> I do not have any ready answer to this. <laughs> if there is a, a click or compatibility between the uh, mind, heart, and uh, intellect of the student and the teacher comes to a sparking point, then even you don't need 45 minutes. Even within a minute, there can be communication. Communication without words, 
and even eye contact can change the mindset of the other. 45 minutes is uh, not adequate time, but what we may try to utilize it optimum. The first is uh, the teachers uh, and students' compassionate intimacy shall have to be established. This word is uh, not commonly used, but in uh, Krishnamurti cycle, now it is uh, gradually coming to the usage. Compassionate intimacy. Compassionate intimacy means an intimacy without attachment. An intimacy without attachment between the teacher and the student then you will be able to uh, connect all three together, the heart, the intellect, and the mind, at a spontaneously. I can say only this much. So, before concluding the work of text from our section, I humbly request this minute to find just a few personalities who have been helping the uh, in the moment of alternative education.
His blessing in future for enlightening me, his family, for educator, for life. As the support comes to him, all those people who have been helping us at the next stage in making this event successful. Thank you very, very much. I'm so grateful to be eminent professor, Sambhu Rinpoche, Sambhu Rinpoche, and all the participants. Thank you.